box and see what is going on there. Ants, beetles, and doodlebugs were crawling around and living together. I observed all the dandelions. They were in full bloom, and I had fun blowing the fuzz off. Wow. Thanks, Zachary. That was pretty awesome. This week, we're going to be joined by our resident plant expert, Del Orlowski, in an edible plant ID and walkabout around campus. Del is one of our on-call instructors. He lives in our local community, and he's worked here at Ashokan for many years. We really love what he's done here for us at Ashokan. As you will see, he really loves plants, and he knows a lot about them. And as you follow along with Dell, take notes so you can impress your friends next time you're out in the woods and you need something to nibble on. We have a few resources below, one main resource really, and that is a link so that you can find edibles in your own backyard. So definitely check that out later. Below, you can also find the Dropbox so you can comment or send in photos of any wild edibles that you may find at your own home. Important reminder about this video, as you walk around the woods with Dell, make sure to not eat anything unless you and Dell are 100% sure you know what it is and you know that is totally safe to eat. Dell is going to explain to you shortly different ways to identify plants. One of those ways is he's going to teach you whether the leaves emerge from the stem as opposites or alternates. Great. Like those photos that you see right here. All right. So without further ado, let's get out there and meet Dell. What do you see? What do you see out there? Some people say they, they just see, well, I see trees. I see grasses and sedges and, and bushes and, and things, you know, just green. Uh, but what I see, when I look out there, I see food and medicine and a habitat. Places to explore and to uh, discover. And not only for myself, but for uh, all the animals that come. They are looking for food and medicine. Yeah, they, they are taking in the plants and, and it's a medicine for them. So we're gonna be going around and we're gonna be exploring different habitats. We're gonna look at woodland areas and meadows and the wetland areas. And, and we're gonna talk about the, the various di uh, different kinds of uh, weeds that are growing here. Emerson said it really well. He said that a weed is a plant whose virtue has yet to be discovered. And so we're gonna discover the virtues of these plants uh, as we explore. I want to uh, take you along. Come along with me. This is a uh, meadow uh, area. It's an open, sunny area. This used to be the old campus of, uh, of the Ashokan, and they moved it up to drier land so they can uh, um, have the Ashokas uh, have a flood water. This is so. This is kind of a floodplain. But uh, we have a lot of plants that do really well, and one of them is wild bergamot, which is a great pollinator plant as well. And it's right here. You see these little purple leaves? They also have uh, opposites. And uh, if you look underneath the leaf, you see this purple color. See that? Yeah, and that's one way to identify it. Another way to identify it is by the uh, last year's uh, flowers. So this is the seed head of the last year's flowers. This was a lavender, kind of a purplish, light purple color uh, on this. So this is another way to identify it, and you follow it all the way down. So uh, this is a great pollinator plant. Uh, it's also, being that it's called wild bergamot, uh, and it's in the mint family. And the mint, uh, it makes it a good uh, tea. Uh, they don't uh, actually call them teas, they call them infusions. So when, when you talk about uh, other plants uh, that are, are either uh, fresh or, or they're dried uh, leaves, uh, they're called infusions. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about how to use bark and roots. They call that a decoction. Um, and that's another way of extracting 
the, uh, the nutrients uh, that are and flavors that are in the plant. So come, we'll look at some other areas as well. So uh, these are all tussock sedges uh, that are growing here and stabilizing the, the s soil on the bank here. So these are, they live, uh, they call them tussocks because they're, you know, they're up on, uh, on these little mounds almost and they're very beautiful. All the grasses that you see that are tall like this are all tussock sedges. And they're part of the uh, a family called graminoids. We have sedges, uh, we have rushes, and we have grasses. And there's a, a, an old saying that I heard that goes like this. Uh, uh, sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses are hollow all the way to the ground. So that's a way to identify. So what that means is that these have edges on here. Let me pull this. Yeah, thank you. And so these are very narrow leaves and they have edges on here. So that's one way to identify the sedges. Oh, we have another plant here. I want to tell you about this. This is uh, on a walk about a year ago. We had one of the students and we just started the walk and we were exploring uh, the uh, different salamanders and, and frogs and, and crayfish that are on the edge here. And, and uh, one of the, uh, the students uh, ended up getting a bee sting and he was really in pain and he uh, thought that he had to go to the nurse. And I asked him, I said, you're not allergic uh, to uh, these things? He said, no. He said, okay, are you willing to try some herbal medicine? And he said, uh, yeah. And, uh, and so I said, come on, over here, let's look around. And over here, I want to show you uh, this plant uh, uh, we found. There are two kinds of plants that we, we have growing in this uh, uh, section. One is called the European or narrow plantain. Before we take the plantain leaf, uh, I, I follow a, a Native American uh, philosophy uh, that I learned long, long time ago. Um, and that is uh, when I, I'm studying a, a plant, I always ask permission, not only to the people that are, are harvesting from, uh, that own this land and take care of it, but also you want to ask the plant itself. Yes, yes, the plant itself. You want to ask, and, uh, and that might be kind of uh, strange to a lot of people. But uh, the truth is, uh, my teachers have told me that it's, it just shows a sign of respect. And what you're trying to do is develop a relationship with these plants. The idea is to ask, may I take this for medicine? So I ask, you know, may I take you? Be very conscious about it and mindful. And take a leaf, and, and this is an identification. You'll see the, uh, the veins on this. It's almost very elliptical. You see these lines that go from from the, uh, the pedicle to all the way around to the, the tip. So they're almost, uh, they call these parallel veins sometimes, and they're very stringy. This is called plantain, European plantain. And uh, it's very, the healing, uh, which this young boy did, he crushed the leaf of this to get the medicine. So he crushed it with his hands, or if, he, uh, if uh, uh, you can chew this and then spit it out, that's another way of uh, crushing and, and getting the juice of the plant. So you get the juice and he rubbed it into the bee sting. Within 30 seconds, the, the pain went away. And he was able to do the entire walk that we did the rest of the day. So he followed me, the rest of it, asking every single plant, what's this used for? What's this used for? And I had stopped and talk about it. And it was part of the class uh, lesson. But it's really important to get uh, three examples uh, from uh, either experts, uh, people that uh, are knowledgeable about plants like myself. Um, and uh, another one is to uh, get a guidebook. I have uh, Peterson's guide. Uh, let me show you that. I'm gonna pull out this, this, uh, this book, one that I use and carry around with me, only because I, I, I've used them the most. Classic of uh, Peterson's guides is that these are things that, that you wanna look for on the, on the plant to identify it. So, and uh, so, but photos are really nice as well. So this one has uh, some photos. This is an older book, uh, but there are some really cool 
uh, identification book. So this is a, a second one. Another one might be that you have it on your iPhone. Of, uh, take a photo of the plant and then, uh, and then be able to, uh, uh, it, it searches the internet uh, for similar plants. That's very helpful. Um, another one is uh, to actually go on uh, social media uh, that specialize in that region uh, that you're in and post the photos of the plant, where, where it's uh, growing on the side, uh, what kind of plants are growing nearby, what kind of habitat, and they're in the region where you're, you're, you're pulling it. Um, so those are really critical things. Send them out and uh, a lot of times within uh, seconds you'll be able to get uh, answers from, from experts uh, that are, will give you the, the genus and species of the plant. It's really cool. I've used it for a, a number of plants. I still use it uh, just to make sure that I have a, the exact plant. So be 100% sure of what you're, you're picking. So another plant I want to talk about is this one. This is a, uh, not, it's a non-native uh, plant. It's also considered an invasive plant. Uh, invasive uh, plants are plants that have taken over an ecosystem. Uh, they, they cause uh, uh, health uh, concerns uh, or economic uh, concerns uh, uh, because they, they take over and choke out the, the, uh, the plants for native plants that uh, birds and other wildlife uh, really uh, depend on. So these, uh, this one is called uh, common mullein and it has this furry so i'm again i'm gonna think about it and, and ask is it okay to to pull this so okay, yes okay so i'm gonna pull this and it has this furry kind of almost like a velvet kind of feel to it uh, which is really cool and it has this kind of rosette on this will be uh, this is a biennial meaning that it takes two seasons uh, to grow from, uh, uh, from the seed to uh, its flower. So the second year, we'll have this long stalk that will grow up maybe three, five, six feet tall, and, and there'll be yellow flowers that will uh, form. Common mullein was used by the Romani, uh, and they would, uh, if they had holes in their shoe, uh, they would uh, uh, put this inside the sole to, to fill the gaps. Uh, that were in their shoe and keep them uh, feet warm because it has a fuzzy furry uh, kind of a uh, feel to it so it was really cute a lot of the uh, students actually uh, there was a student that in particular that I'm thinking of that actually did that he took his shoe off and he put it in just to see what it would feel like you know it's also called a, a, a cowboy toilet paper um, Quaker ladies uh, used to use this actually uh, to rub they rubbed it on their cheek and then they have a rosy uh, feel. Uh, it's also good for, for the throat. They found that there are medicines in this uh, plant that are very soothing to the throat. And people with bronchitis and, uh, and asthma. So a lot of people harvest this uh, and keep it. They dry it and keep it throughout the whole winter and use it as a tea uh, to uh, be very soothing. So let's go to the next section uh, and we'll, uh, we'll show you some new plants uh, as well. Come on, come on. So ethnobotany is the study of how people in a particular culture or region make use of indigenous or native plants. Today we include non-native plants that colonists brought here from Europe and Asia. All of these plants are truly amazing because they not only provide food and medicine, but also shelter and fibers and oils and dyes and gums and soaps and waxes and latex and and tannins and even contribute to the very air we breathe. In that sense, that they provide oxygen for us, all plants are healing. So here we have, uh, we have different kinds of moss. These are brown colors. Once it rains, it, all the uh, will turn into green and bright green and be a little bit taller. These are called hair cap moss. But what we're looking for is this particular plant. I'm going to pull this a little bit. And I, oh, yes. These are ancient plants that have been around for thousands, millions of years and survived oh, 
through the dinosaurs and beyond all the ex different areas of uh, times. This is one of the first plants that came uh, on land, are these mosses. And this is a, a called sphagnum moss. It grows in wet areas. Whenever I see this, I know that it's, uh, it's a wet area a lot of part of the time. Right now, it's, it's kind of dry because we had several days of without rain. So, but once it rains, this will turn bright green. But these are really good because they only grow in uh, that moist area, but they're also very acid. And they uh, were used by the Native Americans as a uh, type of uh, diaper. They, this is like the first disposable diaper um, that they use. But it's also good for band-aids. You can use this as a, as a form of medicine and uh, because it, it's so sterile, uh, meaning that uh, there's no bacteria in it um, because of the acid. Uh, it can be used as a quick band-aid and, and then wrapped, uh, wrap that and hold it in place. Let's go to the next plant. Come on, we're going to the next section. So we've come to the, one of my favorite trees uh, that uh, um, all the trees are, are great, but this one I particularly like. Uh, it's called uh, black birch, the Tula uh, uh, lenta. It's uh, called the Tula lenta is the botanical name. So this is black birch. There we have five birches here at the Ashokan that grow in the Cat whole Catskill area. Um, one uh, is the black birch. We have a yellow birch. We have um, white birch, ray birch, and river birch. And uh, you see in a lot of these, the yellow birch and the black birch especially, and it has a special kind of fragrance that um, I, we're going to talk about in a little bit. So to identify the black birch, uh, you have these horizontal lenticels, they call them. They're little identification, they're marks uh, on the tree that go horizontal to the, uh, the branching. But let's look at the leaves of this. So when you're looking at the leaves, look at whether it's opposite. Here we have alternate. So you have the branching main branch comes out here, comes out here. It's alternating all the way up. You won't see it on both sides of it. So this is an alternate. And here you have the, the leaves are doing the same thing. They're alternate in, in pairs like that. So you're observing. You'll look at the, uh, the edges. Right at the edges, you can see a little teeth on there and look at the shape of it and the veins so study it really really well look underneath and on the top so I'm going to ask it if it's okay uh, to prune it and see there are many of them here and I think it's going to let me do this so I'm going to do this really carefully so I'm going to show you how I'm going to take the, my knife out again and I'm going to prune this in a certain way see this is a node where the plant the, the branching comes out. So I'm going to come just above that node, right above it, and then I'm going to cut it like that. So that can heal. If you do it in the middle, uh, have a section that is open to infection. So that will heal very quickly. So this uh, has a, was used for many years and still used today as a fragrance a lot of uh, students say that it smells like, like mint or gum. I said, gum? Is that a fragrance? Can you think of a, another fragrance that's similar? The chemical on here is called menthol salicylate. And it's very closely related to aspirin. Salicylates are, are, have pain relieving qualities. And this one it does too. And it was used for that. But it was also used for flavor. So this one has the smell of wintergreen. Oh. oh my gosh, that's so good. And, and Native Americans and uh, colonial people too, they used to cut this. And because of the medicinal aspects of it, they would chew it. And use it as a, a toothbrush. And all the fibers were Mmm, it's so good. And after a while, uh, you'll see that it starts to take the, the look of a toothbrush. 
use these for as a toothpick as well if you can get a real narrow one but what I like to do sometimes is uh, collect a whole bunch of this and I, I take the bark of it we had talked about uh, confusions now this one you would actually do a decoction so you take the outer bark of it and this is the live part of the tree see that green that's in there so that green part is the live part of the tree and that's where all the fragrance this is a uh, two uh, sets of cells there are xylem and phloem that are going through xylem is coming from the roots up uh, up the tree getting all the minerals and the phloem is all the carbon that's being made from the leaves going down to the roots so these are just underneath the bark of the tree and I would scrape this a whole bunch of these branches I get a, like a handful of these and put them in a pot and boil the water or boil the water first and just let it sit if it's uh, really hot so the, that would pull the all the uh, menthol out of that so you have this nice wintergreen flavor to it so black birch has that flavor and yellow birch the other birches that I mentioned the gray birch the uh, white birch and the river birch they don't have that smell to it only the black birch and the yellow birch are used and this one was used commercially for wintergreen production at one time so excellent plant to know let's go to the next plant come on collecting right now acorns uh, from probably this um, red oak that's here now acorns are have also the tannic acids in them that uh, are really bitter and uh, you don't want to ingest those you want to wash them so I'm going to take this husk off and show you what a acorn looks like The tannins on this are probably pretty much gone, so it's starting to root. So you can actually, it's in good shape. You can probably eat it. If it was fresh in the in the fall, you would want to wash this in a, in hot water before you made uh, any kind of. It's high in protein. One of the reasons why deer love this, this these acorns, but squirrels do too, and they hide them. So I'm going to try with one of these. Let's try what they... No, no, oh, it's pretty good right now. I think uh, being that all the tannins are gone and it's starting to sprout, it's an indication that um, that's uh, more mild. So that's a good uh, source of protein. But here's, here's uh, how to identify. This is one right here. And it has these... these uh, lines on it uh it looks like an iron has been put on here so you see these like like um uh ski slopes they call them uh going through here all these ridges so that's an identification and that's where all the acorns uh, come and it has a pointed uh the leaf this is last year's leaf so you see all these pointed margins of the leaf uh that's a indication of a of a red oak I am sitting next to moss and and it uh, makes me think uh, that moss as one of the first uh, species that came on land they've been here through all the other previous extinctions that have been here before the dinosaurs before all the previous other extinctions major extinctions that have been uh, on there and there have been about four on the terrestrial land uh, that uh, have been affected and they have been able to survive we have a lot to learn from the mosses why are they so resilient and are we as resilient
it's up to you. So I want to thank you for coming here and I, I uh, ask you to make sure um, everything that we've gone through, make sure you identify 100% and make sure that you uh, ask other experts, look it up, the names of the plants that I mentioned. Um, also look online um, and use uh, uh, special apps that you might find that uh, will help you to identify. Learn one plant at a time and get to know it. It's all about developing a relationship with the plants and harvest honorably by asking uh, and, and, uh, and listen to the plants. And when you, uh, before you leave, uh, send a, a feeling of gratitude, a thank you for the plants uh, and the gifts that they give us. So I'm gonna pass it on to Allie. Take it from here. Thank you so much, Dell. That was a real tasty treat, don't you think? I hope everyone feels a little bit more confident in their wild plant ID. I know I do. I'm actually drinking some wild bergamot tea that I ran outside and foraged real quick. Mmm, it's really fresh and delicious. It's pretty magical how you can spend so much time outside in the woods and never actually realize the plants around you are edible and medicinal. It's truly some mind-blowing stuff. Thanks again, Del. Wow. I want to thank all of you again for following us along today and any other week that you may have been here with us. Your support really, truly helps Ashokan uh, survive during this time. So thank you all again. And to wrap up this episode actually before we wrap up the episode i want to tell you a little bit about next week tune in next week same time same place and join rachel and Haley out in the woods and they will teach you everything you need to know about surviving out in the wilderness and now to wrap up the episode i'm going to turn it over to our new friend steven espaniola from the bay area in california Stephen was actually one of the teachers this past weekend at Ukes in Space, which was our virtual ukulele camp. I had the pleasure of hosting him during one of his Zoom classes, and he was a real treat. He was truly awesome. And he is going to close out today's episode by playing a very special Hawaiian song about harvesting edible seaweed. And the song is called Ka Uluwahi O Ka. Hi. All right. Over to you, Stephen. Aloha. My name is Stephen Espanola, and I'm going to do a song for you that talks about the harvesting of seaweed or limu from the ocean. There are so many different types of seaweed in Hawaii, and this song talks about uh, gathering all of that seaweed and ready for consumption. A song called Kauluvehi Okekai.